I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and to turn with me to Ephesians, the third chapter. I want to read verses 8 through 13 that establishes this first part of our, our study. Lesson one is in the foyer, if you don't pick that up. And we have questions, that, but uh, they will be asked in order. Uh, hopefully the, well, the PowerPoint will help uh, the thought process as well. But I want to lay out before our attention just how grand the context is for God's church to be mentioned and how it relates to it. First of all, Paul puts himself in this grand picture. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, was this grace given. Question, what was that grace? To preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. God says, Paul says it's a favor to me. I didn't deserve this. This grace was to preach. Well, the grace of God is to save people. Yes, he's preaching that lesson. He's preaching that gospel. But to him, it was cause of God's grace. A merited favor that he could preach. And to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery. Which for ages had been hid in God who created all things. So something's been hid. Prophets been talking about it. Pre prophesying about it. But it's been hid. Who is this God who created all things? What was his purpose? To the intent that now under the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, all the angelic beings who have no part in salvation, but they're interested in your salvation, might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pause there for a moment. Eternal purpose purpose. Church is connected with the plan of God of salvation, and it's connected with this eternal purpose to save men from sins. In whom, meaning in Christ, we have our boldness and access and confidence. We have the boldness to approach God, to enter that relationship with God. We can do so with confidence through our faith in Him. Without Christ, our faith is void. Without what He did, our faith is empty. We, can, we don't have boldness to get close to God. What a grand picture that we should appreciate deeply into our hearts is this eternal plan of salvation, but the church is right there, that he might be known the eternal purpose of God, and the church had a part in that. Question, church is supposed to be evangelic, and they're supposed to preach the gospel. Uh, that would be true, but what about the church just in its being? Did it manifest the great the wisdom of God? I saw a, a documentary on the great painters in history. And we see that one who painted the Mona Lisa, they took that Mona Lisa painting apart, trying to see how, how did he present that uh, picture? How come that smile is on her face? He was a scientist. And he, he, he kind of took bodies apart <laughs> to find out what the uh, intestines look like. That's how deep he went into the human body. But he was involved in setting forth the pictures of reality. He knew as he investigated the eyes that our peripheral vision is very blurred. Our immediate attention is very focused. So when you focus upon Mona Lisa, you see the... The, the distinction, it's like she's not smiling as much when you see her from a proverbial vision. She is smiling from ear to ear. And then it, he painted so you would have that effect. He interacted, it took him 16 years to paint Mona Lisa. But he was a scientist. He was an inventor. He was an engineer. He looked into the nature of things. And you think her eyes are looking at you? When you, you move, it's because he knew how our eyes took in color. And all of those things are, are, are magnificent. The painting is going to set forth the wisdom of the painter. And God's eternal purpose out here is saving man, and he put the church. And when you see the church, you see it reflects the wisdom of God. Man Gentile, Jew, could be saved through this common faith in Jesus Christ. It unites nations. 
It brings us all together in the spiritual realm. We all needed salvation. We did not need a place to live on earth. Is it more important as our salvation to live in a place in that relationship with God? And I suggest to you, what we're about to study is that relationship. Because I'm a member of the church that belongs to Christ. And I'm not ashamed. It is the church of Christ because of that basis. So I want us to see how that idea of, of the context helps us understand that the church is according to God's eternal purpose. It was hidden in a mystery. So what happens is that it was finally instituted between A.D. 30 and A.D. 33, when the church came into being. And all of a sudden, we see the church established. And now it's according to God's purpose that we've just read. Paul is preaching the grace of God and preaching. He's, he's opening their eyes. He, he says, that's grace just to preach your gospel. But it was to save men and it's eternal purpose that he was to save men. Now in your outline, we, we go through those, those distinct points. And I wanted just to hit it very briefly. The eternal purpose of salvation in Christ. What does Ephesians 1, 4 say? We know the church is related to it some way and hopefully we'll, we'll see how it is. Church doesn't save us, but maybe that's where you find the saved. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even as he chose us in him, when? Would that be a synonym, maybe eternal purpose? He chose us before the foundation of the world. That's the beginning of what we call time. But eternal purpose, hey, that fits. Before the foundation of the world, he made a choice. And he made a choice that his people, saved people, if I can jump ahead a little bit, will be in what relationship? In Christ. I'll be in Christ. Faith in him. That's what we've been reading. And that's very true. That, that we should be holy. This is the type of people we should be. How can I be holy if I'm still in my sins? Eternal purpose of taking care of that. God's already thought that. And without blemish before him, after all, I'm holy and you're not. And so he's going to have to take care that he did that in Christ and do so stand before him in love. Having for our ordained us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ himself. So here it was before the foundation of the world. So we've been seeing our... He, he made that choice that saved will be in Christ. They will be holy people without blemish. They'll be able to have fellowship with God. Jesus made that pathway possible through his death and resurrection. Now, we come into time. And we say, well, it was hidden in a mystery. It was dark. Well, yes, the eternal purpose was kind of fuzzy because we hadn't heard about it yet. The church is part of that eternal purpose. But now we see it's being being brought into existence in time. But what did the prophets say? Turn with me to Isaiah, the second chapter. We've studied Isaiah, and this would just be a, a review, but I hope you remember uh, this passage. But in Isaiah 2 and verse 3, many peoples, many peoples, that will probably be Jew and Gentile, not just the people, but many peoples, shall go and say, come ye, let us go up into the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Why? For out of Zion, the mountain of God, now he paints the picture of Zion, but out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Jehovah, from what place? Jerusalem. Mount Zion, we're going to be tied in in the New Testament with heavenly Zion. That's the church. It's a, it's a spiritual peace. But the law is going to be set forth. We're going to learn God's ways. Where will it start? The word will come from what city? Jerusalem. Now, we come back, we come a little bit later in time. Luke writes the next book called Acts. And he's involved in setting forth what happened. And so in Acts, the second chapter, when we know the church is getting ready to be established and salvation is getting ready to be preached in the name of the Lord. What do we observe that's that's taking that that is taking place? And we see I just put 
a passage, Acts 2 and verse 5, because you have people gathered in a certain place, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Just happened to be there. Now, when he says Jews and devout men, he's saying devout men that were Jews, he could be, yeah, they were devout, but we know from Scripture that those who were distinguished from Jews would be what? Gentiles. They have proselytes. They're no longer just Gentiles, but they have converted to the Jewish religion of one God instead of many gods. And they already had their mind in place as they re recognize there is one God and God's getting ready to unfold his eternal purpose that will include them. And they will need to be saved by Christ, just like their Jewish uh, uh, fellow citizens will. But where are they gathered at this time? They're in Jerusalem, and they're there from all the nations because that's what you did. If you're a converted Jew, you go to the Pentecost feast. And they were all assembled. And when that sermon was preached, they were added unto them in that day about how many souls? 3,000. And then it continued. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to them day by day those that were saved. That's the American standard. You don't see the church there. But what does the pronoun them refer to? We just read earlier in the text, they were, they were added that day unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. Unto them? Who's them? Well, what is the church? It's a collection of people. That's what it means. It's a collective noun. Church is not an individual. Individual is not a church. It's a collective noun. What is it collected? Laws. It's collected buildings. It's collected lands. It's a collection of people. Saved by Christ. Which is part of God's eternal purpose. And we see it fuzzy because we can't see God's mind. We see it fuzzy in Isaiah 2, but we see that Jerusalem is a real place. Of course, Zion in the city of David was a real place. <clears throat> but God's going <clears> to <throat> make use of that <clears throat> as a stronghold, heavenly stronghold. But now we see it, it has come into existence. And they were added unto them, what does the King James say? Added to the church. It was something happening daily. To them, the church, the collection of people. And so we begin to realize the church has now been uh, established. And it is according to God's eternal purpose. Now, with just that in, in mind, I want you to rank by in priority. What is greater than the other institution that God has set forth in your life? And if you refuse to do that, why would you do it? Just put yourself there. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. I will put one of God's institutions above another of God's institutions. You need to harmonize things. And I just refuse to do that. That's the first question of this, of this lesson. I don't want to have part of it. Well, is that the way you feel? I understand. I understand. Because God has instituted all three. He's instituted all three. And we're studying all three, by the way. We just got through with what? Please. Thank you. The family. And pretty important. It's got our minds centered upon that. But what about ranking them in their priority? So, if you refuse, you don't have to participate anymore in this question, okay? Nobody's forcing you. But when you think about it, I hope some passages come to mind. This, I can rank those. How do we, how, what, what do we do? A soldier's asked. God first. I don't know, family second. Government third. That's the way they, people would rank it. Family first, 
God second. I don't know how people do it, but I've heard people, I'll rank them. So you ought not be too shy of ranking things. What comes first in your life? When you have to make a choice. So, I want to know why, if, uh, why, why refuse, and then I, I like to know, because I'm asking to do it, how would you do that? What would you place first and why? Why would we put the church? I heard that, and I agree with that. But why would you place the church above the family? Why would you do that? Matthew 10, 34 through Matthew 10, 39. That's exactly right. Because see, the relationship of the church is in Christ. And Christ says sometimes you'll have to make a choice. So why wouldn't you rank the church above the family? Because he said, I didn't come to send peace. Well, I thought you were the prince of peace. I thought, these, I thought that when Jesus was prophesied of bringing forth the message of the new covenant, he's bringing forth peace. We have peace with God. Yeah, peace with God. And we've seen that when we apply what God says about the family, we're going to have a wonderful family. When all are in tune to that authority of the Lord. And we've seen how that can interact. But what we see here now, what happens when family does things? Or they don't like what you've done. Who comes first? Church or family? Sadly, a lot of times it will be family. And while times, sometimes it happens, it will divide the church. Families do that. And we can't let that happen. And we see that that's, that's there. And because of Matthew 10, just like you say, that, that would be my first uh, passage that would say, I'm going to probably put family after church. Now, let's go to the next step. You put family. What, what, is, what about putting government before the church? Uh, government, family, and church. That's how the way we usually live. <laughs> we'll put family above the church, but we're, we're not going to do that. That's not good. David, what, what would you, would you put a government or family? I do. I want to start there. That's good. Thank you. And you're right. The next step's going to be a little interesting. But no... I must, Acts 5.29, I got Matthew 10, I got Acts 5.29, that's in my, I'm, I'm not, this is what I think so, this is what God demands, that when the government says you will not preach Christ any longer, or you're not going to worship the way God said you're going to worship, they want to put down their hammer and change that. Church comes before government. I'm so thankful we live in a country that a constitution says we got that freedom. Limited government, especially when it comes to our faith and, re and religion and, and the church is a part of that. And that's what's being fragmented today. But we must take a stand. And people say, well, yeah, it has to be exactly something that really contradicts things and keeps you from doing what God said you could do in another way. Now, that's, that's the battles we've been having with COVID and coming together to take the Lord's Supper. People are thinking of different ways to do church. And yet we still have the pattern before us. And sometimes we'll have to make a decision. And what comes first? Church comes first in any category. Because that's a relationship I have with God through Christ. And he's told me sometimes families are not going to follow Christ. And sometimes government is not going to allow you to follow Christ, and which Christ demands. And so we have to make that decision. What about second and third place now? What about family and government, or government and family? 
Is that a little harder for you? We talked about the responsibilities that we have as parents to raise our own children, that we're to bring them up in nurture admonition of the Lord. Wonder if now, conspiracy theory, they're going to take your children and deprogram them and make Democrat socialists out of them. They may force that. Who comes first? Family over government. Or put it, let's make it real stark. You will abort that baby. You've already had one. And you will abort that baby and we'll pick the sex that's going to be saved. That's not conspiracy theory. That's the way people are having to live. What comes first, government or family? You're contradicting how my Lord, who comes first, is telling me how to raise my family and to abort a, a living member of my family. They're not a member yet. They're not born yet. They're alive. They're human. And just if that was just a human, I can give you scripture of, of God protecting human life. And what's the government supposed to be doing? Protecting the good. Not enforcing the evil. They're a guard against that. And when government doesn't do that, and how come government can do that? Because it's made up of people. Just like the church can go astray. Families can go astray. Government can go astray. But who is always the place to come back to? To see which priority are we going to make today in our life? It's God and not your think souls. It's God in his word. And that's what we have to build our people on who are members of this church. Because I think church comes first because it's relationship with Christ, even though relationship to Christ, and the family and government. But those are things that we honor because we're connected with him. And we've seen in those two passages. Sometimes we have to make a choice for God and we will be at odds with family. We'll be at odds with government. And sometimes when you touch the family, you'll be at odds with the government because sometimes that's being, being changed. Any, any questions or comments on that question? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we put these in categories as though they're separate. And for me, we think that the church can never be broken. But for me, the church broke. When I was 26, I went from Mormonism. My family was broken, and I had to separate those. And even now going forward, the church is not something that's unbreakable because as a local congregation, people can break that. But if you consider as though church is the universal church, the principles in the word, that can't be broken. And that is the first priority. Okay. And we'll, we'll hit that on our questions. Thank you. Anyone have questions about this? But that's very, very true. I, we could jump to it now, but I have it later on uh, because it's part of our questions. And I think that's true. And I'll just put out here, can you, can you break the universal church? No. So when you talk about breaking the church, what did, what did he say? Dan said it's the local church. That's what the devil can prevail against. Not the universal church. Because he can't handle that. And we'll emphasize that a little later. But that distinction must be made. The church, let's just talk about the definition of the church. And this is where we have to take some steps of understanding. But we can, when we understand it, we might skip a step. But I don't want to do that today. The English word church. What Greek term did that come from? What was the term? See, you've already jumped on me. Our English word church didn't come from Ecclesia. Old English, Kirche, Dutch, Kirk, Kirche, German. I know it's bad German, but it's close. Excuse me? Kirka, that's what I said. 
<laughs> Thank you. And the Greek, <laughs> I worked on that, David. I know I'm not good, but I worked on it. I got close. Kurikon, well, Doma is, is a house, but what he said, Kurios, that's Lord. And so it was used in the Greek of Lordship, but that word is not found in the New Testament. That's not the word for church in the New Testament. But it's the background of our word church. Can we say, well, it is the Lord's house. <laughs> in a way, family, house, I could, I could get there. But the very word did not come from that. Our word church. We, we have it a religious term. And in the Greek, they, have, they would have doma, a house. It was the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord and it's the Lord's house. And there'll be that, that spiritual connection and maybe some connected with the physical building. I don't know. But where we do come in to play with the church is that the Greek word ekklesia, different from hurikan, is a word that we find that the word church was used to translate that particular Greek term. And how vivid is that meaning when we understand the Greek term that was used to denote the church? First of all, three times, it's just an assembly that's secular in nature. That's, that's, that's the Greek word. But what, what does, combine me two things of ecclesia that you see there. What, how do you put them together? Ek means out of, out and then kaleo means to call. So I'll put those things together to call out, or the called out, to put in the passive. That's the church, the called out. But wonder if you are a called out group of people to determine things in the marketplace, to determine laws that are secular in nature. Could you call that an ecclesia? Holy Spirit did. Turn with me to, to Acts, the 19th chapter. Acts 19 and verse 32. When he says, since some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. There's our word ecclesia. Why isn't it church? It's an assembly. See, church means we've been called out. We're together in a group. And this was an assembly and it was chaos. It was a mob. It was a mob. Not making sense. All confused. What's happening? They're all, they're all up in, in a rage. They were in confusion. And the more part knew not wherefore they come together. Come together. Assembly. Now, we drop down to verse 41. And this secular assembly governmental it says and when he had spoken he dismissed the assembly so here were they together what happens when he dismisses them they scatter they're no longer an assembly in that in that context he dismissed them and they could assemble again for another mob outing if they wanted to but in the middle of that we see from the standpoint of government type of make, government taking decision, making decisions, we begin to see how that term is, is used in verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in, was in confusion. I just read that. Now, uh, verse 39, I'm sorry. Verse 39, when we says, if therefore, it says, if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen that are with him, they're the ones complaining, because they made idols and so forth, have a matter against any man. The courts are open, and these are proconsuls. Let them accuse one another. But if you seek anything about other matters, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. Not this called out mob assembly, the regular assembly. Context means something, it matters. But if you want to say, well, well in the regular assembly of the church, ecclesia, is the Greek word. Church is what, it's, what it is. No? See, that means to me that the words that the Holy Spirit used, they had a context, but they had a meaning that we need 
to keep in, in mind. You can talk about this church today that we have assembled and we are an assembly. When the church assembled together, emphasis upon what assembly does. And here we see that here is the word that's going to denote the, the church, a collectivity of people, and we're going to look at context in which they're found. But we need to understand that that was a word that also used for mobs and for regular assemblies. But that's not all. It was used for people of God's people under Israel gathering together in the wilderness. Acts 7 and verse 38, we observe Stephen's preaching. He said, this is he that was in the, my American standard says, church in the wilderness. Why would you think they would do that when they do assembly pretty well, <laughs> when it's about secular? Well, is, was there a religious connotation here? Very much so. We're not talking about a mob. We're not talking about those who just determine secular laws. We're talking about the people of God. That he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel that spake to him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received living oracles to give unto us. They had a religious connection. Now while he was with the assembly of Jews in the wilderness, he gets a law. Law came from Caesar, law came from God. And so I don't know why they translated the way they did, but I can understand why. But what, what is common to all that? It's a grouping, a collection of people. Any way you look at it. And that's what fits with the church in the sense that we are talking about it today. So let's see if that works. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, the Apostle Peter speaks about the people who were not people, and now they are the people of God to, to be collected together. And so what do we see? You're an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that he may show forth the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Someone asks you, what, what is the... What do you mean by the church being the called out? I hope that passage comes to mind. Well, every one of the members of our church that I'm a part of, they've been called out of the darkness of sin. And then all of a sudden you can go, you've been called by the word, the gospel. See, truth will harmonize. And, but it lets you realize, I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about a people. And I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about a people. And when we've been called out of the world, we're sanctified by the blood of Christ. We are saints. We've been called out of the world. So that fits with the word church. And it fits with the concept, were they a mob? <laughs> Was the church established in the Old Testament? People take that passage and say that. But it's wrong. But the called out will go in every place. That's why they took the church and they didn't use the Greek kurion, the idea of we belong to the Lord. It was a group of people. And ecclesia was the word that the Holy Spirit used in the context of who we are. Ephesians 5.23. <clears throat> and I'm just trying to build that so we can answer some questions based upon Scripture. Then you are think so. In Ephesians 5, 23, he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, this also be familiar to it, as Christ also is the head of the church, thank you, being himself the Savior of what? The body. And of course, we're going to see in Ephesians 1 that that body is the church, ecclesia. But so we see that he is the head of the church, being himself the Savior of, of the body. The church is the body. The body is the church. There's a spiritual collectivity of people and that he's indeed head of. And who are those people? How many bodies does he save? One. That's what it says. 
Now, if we want to have some more, we'll go, we'll go find it, I guess. But what we're seeing here, there's, see, when you have uh, the body and it is a collective now, that includes everybody in that grouping. What is that grouping called? What is that assembly collection of people called? It's called the church. And that we're the ones that belong to Christ because Jesus in Matthew 16, 18 says he would do what? He would build his church and the gates of hell, Hades, the idea of death, shall not prevail against it. And so in Acts 8 and verse 3, we see the church being persecuted, made havoc of the church. So what did they do? Is it a separate, they just tore down the buildings. They just burned it to the ground. They destroyed the church. They destroyed the local church. Well, how were, how were they destroying the local church? How, how were they making havoc of that? Well, the context will help you. But Saul laid waste the church, entering into every house and dragging men and women, committed them to prison. Here's the context. <clears throat> Went into every house. Church singular. They were members of the church and how they would make havoc of the church, what they stood for. We're serving Christ. They could go in every house that comprised people of that collectivity and make havoc of the church because we're going to take its individual members and we're going to persecute them to death. What happens when COVID takes 26 people and infects them of our congregation? It made havoc of it. But he didn't make havoc of everybody in one place and destroyed this building. It takes individuals. And so there's a context where we are collected together as a church, but we're comprised of what type of people? Saints have been called out of darkness. We belong to Christ. And he says, I will build my church. Can they be found in a locality? In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 2, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, even to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, brick and mortar. No people who are called by the gospel to be set apart from the world, 1 Peter 2, 9. It just all comes together with a concept that these are called out people who've been called out by the gospel who belong to Christ, and that's the church that he said he would build. So there's a lot of steps, and you don't have to, y'all jumped right to it because you're taught, I and mean, that's good, but you might have kind of somebody that is not taught, they'll think church is the building. They just, they desecrated our church. There's been a COVID mask on the, on the church idol out here. It's people think that's our, our idol. And I know I saw a COVID mask on it, and then Halloween I will see a devil's mask on it. And I've had, I've had a, a very religious lady come by and said, they desecrated your church. What did they do? She took me out there. Well, you would probably laugh, but you can't laugh then. <laughs> But that's the kind of concept of church. But we, our church can be, can be made havoc of because of individuals suffering what they do. I understand that. And that can be a local church. But it, it, will, it won't prevail. So this will be, we have to, have to stop. But we'll, we'll start there as we look at the universal and local sense of the church. And we'll uh, ask some other questions in line with that. But you have the outline there. Go over it, go over the questions and think about them and, and uh, we'll, Lord willing, we'll, we'll start again there. Thank you.